Hey, you've probably seen a billion airplanes, right? But have you ever seen a fighter jet? I mean, look at it. It's fast, it shoots missiles, and it makes a zoom sound when it flies past you. But you might be thinking, what's the difference between a normal airplane? Airplanes also make noises, and they also zoom past you. Aside from the missiles, you're right. They look pretty similar, with both having engines, wings, a nose, tail, you get the point. They also have the same four forces that keep them moving up and around the air. Those forces are drag and thrust for horizontal movement, and lifting gravity for flying high in the sky. If the force of lift is greater than the force of gravity acting on it, then the jet moves up, and if the force of thrust is greater than the force of drag, the plane moves forward. This is essentially part of the concept of net force. Seems simple, but these forces don't come magically, no do they? Uh, they don't. The aircraft initially moves by the engine taking in air and forcing it in the opposite direction of the turbine, which creates our thrust force. Air resistance and acts on the aircraft, which then creates our drag force in the other direction. One force trying to push forward, and the other trying to push it backwards. Air molecules start bouncing against the bottom of the wings, which then gives us our lift, but then the Earth's gravity pulls us back down, which is our weight. Anyway, now that you know how an airplane generally works, and we can all fly happily together forever. Well, sorry to break it to you, but everything is imperfect. Planes and jets have their flaws too. Which leads me into my next point of what if things for the pilots of these jets go wrong? Think of the scenario. You are a pilot piloting a jet right now, really high up in the air. Uh, let's say 50,000 feet high. But then suddenly, blam! Your jet engines have decided it's had enough, it's out of there, and it's on fire. And would you look at that, you've earned a one-way ticket to crashing right into the ground, and you are probably panicking right now. But don't panic, everything will be okay. Panicking just makes things worse. A uh, quick somewhat related fact, the average heart rate is 60 to 100 BPM, but a well-trained athlete can have a resting heart rate of only 40 BPM, so stay calm. High heart rate means high anxiety and stress, so calm yourself, okay? Okay. Analyze the situation. You're at least 50,000 feet or greater and you're about to crash into the ground at 546.5 meters per second in 58.5.8 seconds using kinematics equations. Which, in other words, you're gonna hit the ground faster than the speed of sound at Mach 1.3 if the temperature at that height is negative 56.5 degrees Celsius. And the landing's probably gonna really hurt, but on the, hey, on the bright side, you have 55.8 seconds to figure out what the hell to do. If you can't land the jet within those 55.8 seconds and you have zero other options, hopefully you remember that a group of physicists and engineers came together to create a life-saving device called the ejection seat. And uh, P.S. You're sitting right on top of one. When the ejection seat is pulled, it will blow out the hatch of the jet above you and force you up and out 100 feet away from the jet using rockets or an explosive powered catapult. And this all happens within a fraction of a second. Ready? Pull it! Great, you're in the air, and depending on how fast you were going, you've probably just experienced 12 or more Gs. In other words, 12 or more times the force of gravity. Your body is also most likely freaking out, as you have had the force of the rockets pushing you upwards, the force of the Earth's gravity pushing you down at 12 or more Gs, which, therefore, your spine is being compressed like a drill press. Now what? Well, you're probably spinning around mid-air rapidly now, but no worries. Your seat has sensors that automatically pull the drogue chute to stabilize your trajectory and altitude mid-air. Your main chute does not deploy until you are below 15,000 feet, which then your seat will detach and you'll be left floating down towards the Earth. Oh, and there's also an oxygen tank with you, so try to use it. Congratulations, you've made it out of a burning jet alive using the ejection seat. Here are some cool ejection seat facts. You have a 90% chance of survival while ejecting out of the seat, and Martin Baker, one of the world's leading manufacturers for ejection seats, run an exclusive club where they give you a tie for telling them your bailout story. Pretty cool stuff. Now that we've covered the pilot side of jet physics using ejection seats as one example, let's move on to the pedestrian side of things. Why are airstrips usually in some remote location and not around a city? Well, for safety reasons one, but another reason is because they're loud. Let me explain by showing you how sound works. Sound travels in waves. It goes up and down, up and down, and over and over again. The reason why sometimes things are loud and sometimes things are quiet depends on the amplitude of the wave, which is the distance between the axis of oscillation, or base of line, to the highest or lowest point on the wave. The pitch of a sound depends on the frequency, which is how many times the sound vibrates in a second. Frequency is measured in what you might call the hertz. You might have also heard of the decibel, which is the loudness or volume of sound. 
Really loud sounds have a high decibel, while really quiet sounds have a low decibel. For comparison, a computer running is 40 decibels, while a military jet taking off is 140 decibels. Now, you might be thinking that 140 minus 40 decibels means 100 times louder, right? Nope. That means it is 10 billion times as loud, and it is based on a logarithmic scale of base 10. And, remember how I said the military jet takes off at 140 decibels? Well, the point at which you can rupture your eardrums is also 140 decibels. So how do people protect against this? Ear defenders or earplugs, that's how. Ear defenders are those thick, padded headphones that workers wear, and they're pretty effective at slowing down and reducing the waves, blocking off 15 to 30 decibels of sound. Combining earplugs and ear defenders can also give greater protection, but even with this protection, you shouldn't be exposed to this level of sound for too long as you'll risk hearing loss. Ear defenders are pretty cheap too nowadays, only costing $30 for some decent protection. The last thing I want to talk about is the Doppler effect in the sonic boom. When a jet hits the speed of sound of Mach 1, it creates an enormous amount of energy, kind of like a crack effect around it. This is what you call the sonic boom. It is super loud and it might even cause damage to structures as the frequency vibrations are that high. And have you ever heard of a plane or jet fly past you before? How when it goes from a higher pitch to a lower pitch whoosh? That is the Doppler effect and how the frequency depends on the direction of where the object is heading. Hopefully that clears up some of the things about jets and aircrafts in general. Thanks for watching and I hope this video helps you in one way or another.